Welcome to My Tech Gear, and today I'm looking at graphics cards, specifically the 3060 Ti range of cards. So recently I was in the market for a new graphics card, and I wanted something that gave me better graphics for gameplay on a PC, was capable of PC VR, and also helped me with content creation for creating videos like this one, streaming, and other things. So I settled on the NVIDIA RTX 30 series of graphics cards. And in this video, I'm gonna be taking you through why. So I'm gonna be doing that by going through an overview of the RTX 30 series of cards, taking you through some of the features that are available on these cards, give you a bit of a comparison to some of the previous generations, and give you my thoughts and reviews on what I bought, which was the MSI Ventus 2X Overclocked Edition of the 3060 Ti. Let's get into it. So before we go any further, if you do enjoy the video, please don't forget to like and share it. And if you're not subscribed yet, then hit that subscribe button down below and that notification bell so you're notified about new videos as and when I post them. It really helps me build up my channel so that I can keep making videos for you. Thanks. I'm not going into the low level specifics of the cards here as there are other channels that can do this far better than I. So I'll put some links to the likes of Gamers Nexus and Jay's Two Cents, who thoroughly deconstruct cards and have all the testing gear and everything else in the description below. Now, I'm not affiliated with them at all. I just think they make great technical videos. So if you wanted to dive into the nitty gritty and detail, by all means go and check those out. What I'm looking at here for you is what do these cards mean for the average person who just wants to know what features do I get? How much does it cost? And is it worth it? And the NVIDIA cards certainly have plenty of features that provide good value for money. From a performance perspective, other than changing the graphical settings within each game, the two features that will primarily have the biggest impact on how many FPS or frames per second you're going to get in your games are DLSS and ray tracing. So what's DLSS? Well, it stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling. And what that actually means is that the graphics cards will render the screen at a lower resolution. It then up samples it to an image quality that's a higher resolution. What this basically means is you get better graphics at a higher refresh rate. So for instance, a game that might run at 50 frames per second with DLS turned off might run at 75 frames per second with it enabled. So it finally makes it possible to play demanding games at a high resolution using a lower end graphics card. Use DLSS for esports titles and that frame rate is going to go through the roof and you've got more chance of you exceeding probably your monitor refresh rate. This makes DLSS the perfect partner for ray tracing, which is another feature of the 30 series of cards. Ray tracing allows for more realistic visuals in games such as water reflections and sun rays. However, it is a highly intensive task for graphics cards and has a significant impact on the frames per second you get in games. For both of these technologies though, these do need to be enabled within each game, so not every game is going to work with these straight away. Certainly the list of games that support DLSS and ray tracing is quite small. Cyberpunk 2077 and Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War are some games that currently support them. I'll put a link in the description down below that gives you a list of the current games that support both these technologies. Use this where you can though, it makes a huge difference to the visual clarity and performance you can get from your graphics card. Two primary reasons that these cards are so attractive are price and performance. They are significantly cheaper than the previous generation in light for light performance, or you can get a significant performance increase compared to the previous generation if you stick to the same price point. If you look at the current models that are available, and these are the NVIDIA Founder Edition prices, You've got the 3060 Ti starting at 399, going up to 499 for the 3070, 699 for the 3080, and a whopping 1499 for the 3090. That is a massive price for a graphics card. More variants are expected to be released as the year goes on, with Super and Ti variants of the above, and possibly a non-Ti version of the 3060, along with maybe a 3050 variant later on in the year, if we go by trends of previous years. Third-party versions of these cards from the likes of MSI, Gigabyte, Asus, and others are available also, and these typically add a small premium on top of these, as they are often overclocked to some degree. 
Performance wise, there is obviously an increase in performance as you go up the card range, but these are diminishing returns as cost increases. Don't make the mistake of comparing model numbers exactly to last year either, such as don't compare a 3060 Ti to a 2060 variant from last year. Why? Because it will blow these out the water. All of the cards in the 30 series are typically punching a couple of belts above their weight category, so to speak, with the 3060 Ti, for instance, actually beating the 2080 Super from last year by about 7% on average, and at a price that's $300 cheaper than what that card was. These really are great cards. For me, the perfect compromise of price versus performance manifested itself in the 3060 Ti range of cards. 25% cheaper than the 3070 above it, but really only taking a 7% drop in performance. So the version I picked was the MSI Ventus 2X OC version, which is a dual fan edition and that retail for about $440. It is slightly overclocked over the founder's edition and I picked it as I needed it to fit into a slightly smaller case. So I've got an NZXT H500 case behind me and a three fan was really going to be pushing it a little bit. The main reason for buying a graphics card for most people is gaming performance and here the 3060 Ti doesn't disappoint. I tested it here against Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. This is probably one of the most demanding games available at the moment and is a good indicator of how far these cards can be pushed. So comparing just the native resolutions against each other and it's plain to see the difference between the 1080 and 4K images, with 4K providing a far clearer picture and 1440 providing that middle ground between the two, which isn't exactly unexpected. For me though, there was a definite jump up from 1080 to 1440 and probably less so between 1440 and 4K. If we look at ray tracing, this has a significant impact on performance in order to provide better visual realism. So it's not clarity that you're gaining here, but rather more natural visuals when it comes to the presentation of sunlight, shadows and the like. And here we can see the difference in the natural lighting reflected off the face of Adler and the man playing darts behind him. It really does make the game seem more natural, but you do take a pretty significant performance hit for it. If we add DLSS into the mix, there is a performance improvement for ray tracing, although it's not by much in this testing rig. Comparing two images with DLSS enabled and not, and the images are pretty close. Considering that the DLSS image is actually being rendered at a lower resolution and then upscaled, that's pretty impressive. If I look at the test results overall, then there is definitely a ceiling beyond which I could not get the frame rate any higher, with 4K, 1440 and 1080 all maxing out around 68 frames per second when ray tracing wasn't enabled. I did drop that graphics settings to their lowest at 1080p to see if that would improve things, and it did get the frame rate into the 90s, which was much better. The campaign game of Cold War is definitely more graphically intensive than the multiplayer and online modes and it's probably the latter where a lot of people will spend most of their time. So in multiplayer mode at 1080p, we do see a frame rate jump with high graphics settings yielding frame rates in their 40s, whilst low graphics settings yielded frame rates in their 80s. This is simply because the online and multiplayer games are using simpler graphics, which allows faster and smoother gameplay. So certainly for online play, it's the lower settings that work best. Change the games to esports titles such as Apex Legends though and it's a different story. These are far less graphically and CPU intensive games and the frame rates show that. Even at 4K and with high graphics settings, we are getting frame rates close to 100 frames per second. And it's an ascending scale up from there, culminating with 1080p at low settings reaching over 250 frames per second. For me, whilst it excels at 1080p performance, it is 1440 which I think is the sweet spot between visual clarity and performance. In Apex, those rates are still over 150 FPS, even on high settings, and on Call of Duty it's still over 60 FPS which is more than playable. The most notable issue with all this testing is the ceiling that the graphics card is hitting, and it's not the actual graphics card that is at fault here, it's the CPU. The Ryzen 2 400G simply cannot keep up with the graphics card and is creating a bottleneck. This goes to show the importance of a good pairing of CPU and GPU to create a balanced system. 
you can get far better frame rates with a better CPU. Just look up some gameplay on YouTube and you'll see what I mean. So for me, my next upgrade will be the CPU and aiming to upgrade with a Ryzen 5 600X. For now though, it's good to see that the older CPU is perfectly compatible with the 3060 Ti and that I can get acceptable frame rates with it until I upgrade. Switching gameplay over to PC VR, and here we have Half-Life Alex, the best PC VR game I've played to date. Even with the visuals on high graphics, the display is detailed and clear, and the gameplay is smooth. The detail in the game is a significant step up from the simpler graphics that you find on standalone Oculus Quest games. PC VR really does add a whole new dimension to your gameplay, and it's great to see the 3060 Ti more than capable of the task at hand. So to summarize, I've been super impressed with this graphics card. It's given me far more than I ever hoped I could get at this price point. It's faster than a $700 graphics card from last year. I now have a fast gaming PC with great content creation capabilities, not only just from an editing perspective, and a PC capable of running VR without issues. I think the 3060 Ti is a great option. The only other card I could possibly be tempted by if I wanted an increase in performance would be the 3080 range of cards. The 3070 isn't enough of a performance jump to justify the extra hundred dollars and the 3090, well, it's just an insane amount of money to spend on a card. For 1080p or even 1440p gaming, the 3060 Ti will give you more than you need for years to come and that's even with ray tracing enabled. If you're looking for a good 4K graphics card though, then this isn't the right card for you and I'd recommend looking at the 3080 cards instead. For me, the 3060 Ti was the pick of the bunch. I'll put some purchase links down below if anyone wants to go and look at buying that. Whether you get one from MSI or Gigabyte or any other main manufacturers though, I don't think you'll be disappointed. It's just trying to get hold of one at the moment is going to prove difficult. Sellers on Amazon are currently trying to sell 3060 Ti cards for twice their retail price. They're definitely a card that's worth waiting for though, so don't be conned by the scalpers. This happens every year with graphics cards, so just be patient until it all just settles down a little bit. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope it helped you decide what graphics card you're going to get next. If you did enjoy it, please don't forget to like and share it. If you're still here but not subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button down below. And as always, see you in the next one.